We're going to be in the book of Amos. You can turn in your Bibles to Amos chapter 8. The book of Amos is found in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 8. Welcome to those watching online as well. Uh, The title of our Bible study today is Seven Signs of Spiritual Famine. Seven Signs of Spiritual Famine. As you're turning there in your Bibles, listen, God desires to speak to you today. God loves you. If you're here and you're new, God loves you and desires to speak to you today. What we do here at Cornerstone is we read and teach the Bible. And we trust that as we read and teach the Bible that Jesus will draw people to himself as we lift up the name of Jesus high. He desires to speak to you by his Holy Spirit and use you for wonderful purposes. So I pray that God would just now, even as I'm speaking, begin to remove the distractions away from your mind that you might be able to clearly hear from him today and hear from his Holy Spirit as we read his word. Amos chapter 8, seven signs of spiritual famine. Now before we get to Amos the book, a few things about Amos the man. Amos was a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah, but God calls him to speak a prophetic word to the northern kingdom of Israel. Amos prophesied around the year 750 B.C. At the time of Isaiah's prophecy, the nation of Israel is split into two kingdoms. There was a civil war in the nation of Israel. And so now you have the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Amos is a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah, but God calls him to speak impending judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel. Amos, his name in the Hebrew means burden or burden bearer. He's from a small village, Tekoa. It's a small village about south, uh, about 10 miles south of the capital city of Jerusalem. And Amos, he was a regular guy, he was a regular, regular dude, he was not of noble descent, he was not the son of a prophet or a priest. Uh, the Bible tells us that he was a shepherd and a fruit farmer. So he's just a regular average dude. Listen to me today, if you feel like you're not really clear on what your spiritual gifts are, like you don't really feel like you know what God has for you, because you, you feel just like you don't really know your skill set, you're like an ordinary average person person. Listen, that's exactly the person that God wants to use. Why? Because he gets more glory in the process. And when we just humbly submit ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't necessarily know what I'm good at. I don't have a great skill set, but you just humbly submit yourself before the Lord. Listen, all the Lord wants to use is someone who is humble and spirit filled. And this was Amos, ordinary guy, not a particular Uh, skill set, not a professional prophet. He's a regular dude who the Lord uses as his mouthpiece to rebuke the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Amos writes to a nation of Israel who is currently experiencing uh, political, materialistic success and prosperity. Nation of Israel is having it good right now, speaking in 750 BC in the context of our story. Nation of Israel is having it good, political prosperity and peace, but they don't even understand their own spiritual moral depravity. That is the most dangerous place to be. When you have political, materialistic prosperity, but you don't even recognize your own need for the Lord. This was the nation of Israel at this time. And the very first chapter in the book of Amos Amos actually at first, again, by the, uh, being used as the mouthpiece of God, he's the vessel of God, Amos speaks about impending judgment, not upon the nation of Israel in chapter one, but upon the surrounding nations, upon Damascus, Tyre, Edom, and even his own southern kingdom of Judah. And you have to understand and see at this time, as Amos is prophesying to the surrounding nations, Israel's like, this is awesome. We like this shepherd boy, this is cool. And this is what happens even in our, even in our, our own lives. You know, growing up when my dad was uh, maybe disciplining my older brother Tyler. <laughs> because I, as, the, as the middle child, I never received rebuke or discipline. I just, I, I learned from his mistakes and I navigated my way through life. <laughs> but as Tyler was, was being disciplined, okay, this was me in the background. 
And this is what the nation of Israel is doing. Okay, because Amos the prophet is rebuking all of the surrounding nations in chapter one. Israel's there like, oh, this is awesome. But you know what my dad did? When he would hear me snickering behind the scenes, he would say, listen, when I'm done with Tyler, you're next. (laughs) That's what God does through the prophet of Amos to the surrounding nations, rebuking the surrounding nations. Israel's like, this is awesome. Amos then spends chapters two through nine saying, listen, God's got some words for you too. And you're not off scot-free. And he spends the majority of time disciplining the nation of Israel. Why? Two primary reasons. The the nation of Israel had abandoned true worship unto the Lord. Number two, they had rejected God's word and God's instructions. And so God uses the prophet Amos to rebuke the northern kingdom of Israel and to declare impending judgment upon the nation. Let's read Amos chapter 8. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word this morning. We're going to read all of Amos chapter 8. So I hope you're there by now. It is a tricky book to find, but I gave you a few minutes. Amos chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says this, Thus the Lord God showed me, Behold, a basket of summer fruit, or your translation might say ripe fruit, Behold, a basket of summer ripe fruit. And God said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat? The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave, and subside like the river of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only sun and its end like a bitter day. Our key verses are here in verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day, the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. O God, we come before you today and we ask that you would fill us now with your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us through the reading of your word, that you would encourage us and challenge us. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Remove all distractions from our minds that we might be fixed and focused on you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. God often uses common objects to explain spiritual truths. In Amos chapter 8, verse 1, he asks Amos a question. He says, what do you see, Amos? And Amos sees, I see, Amos says, I see a basket of, of summer fruit, New King James Version says. Other translations say, I see a basket of ripe fruit. And God says to Amos, you see correctly, just as you see this basket of ripe fruit, Israel is ripe for judgment. And God goes on to, again, using Amos as his mouthpiece, he goes on to explain the impending judgment that would come upon the nation of Israel. Now listen, you have to understand this. You have to understand this about the character and nature of God. God is a patient God. God is a patient God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, 
but all to come to repentance. In the book of Psalms, it says that God is patient, that He is compassionate and abounding in love, slow to anger and abounding in love. This is the heart of God, but you have to understand this, that God's patience has a time limit. God's patience has a time limit. And in the context of the account here in Amos chapter 8, God essentially says, listen, nation of Israel, you have tested my patience, and my patience has run out. My patience has a time limit, God says. Why? He says, you have been too busy for true worship. You have rejected my word. You have failed to love me, and you have failed to love your neighbor. So Amos tells the nation of Israel, because you have tested the patience of God, abandon worship, abandon God's true word, abandon love for me, abandon loving your neighbor, you will experience judgment. And in the book of Amos in chapter 8, he specifically gives us four different pictures of the impending judgment. The first picture, he says, there will be an earthquake in the land. He says that there will also be darkness over the land. He says there will be singing, but that singing will be turned into weeping. And then finally, it will culminate in the worst judgment of all, our key verses in verses 11 through 12. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land. Now listen, not a famine in the way you would think. God says, this is not a famine of bread. This is not a famine or drought of water. He says, but you will experience a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. He says, you will look for it and you will search for it, but you won't find it. Why? Speaks to the reality of what we as humans go through. When you continue to resist and reject and push against the word of God, when you're desperate and you finally want to discern and know truth, you can't even find it. Because you have so calloused your heart against hearing the truth of God's word. This is the nation of Israel. They have rebuked and rejected God's prophets, God's mouthpiece, God's word. And God says, you don't want God's word, I'll give you exactly what you want. Know God's word, this will be your famine. And even when you want to now know truth and have a relationship with me, you won't find it. You'll search for it, but you won't find it. This is what happens in our own life. We so often dismiss God's word, and when we do that time and time again, our hearts become callous. We can't even discern truth anymore. This is what happens to the people of Israel. God's judgment will be a famine on the land, but the worst kind of famine. Not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. God says, your bellies, they might be full, but your spirits and your souls will be completely dry and empty. Now notice Israel's problem. It was not an issue of God withdrawing his word, but it was an issue of the hearer. He says, there will be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. It's an issue of the hearer neglecting God's word. Now listen, we're not a a church who believes that the church, capital C, or the nation of America has replaced the nation of Israel. Get to Romans 11, read Romans 11. God still has a plan and purpose specifically and uniquely for the nation of Israel. However, our own nation and the nation of Israel in Bible times, there are, are uncanny parallels, namely the founding upon the word of God and how we've strayed from it. Now, bringing this home and bringing this to application, just as we currently hear today, I'm talking about our modern time, just as we currently hear today about impending economic collapse and literal physical famines, we are in the midst of an even greater famine, yet our world can't even detect it. It's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord, where the word of God is not taught God's truth is neglected and rejected. Symptoms and results of a spiritual famine in our culture are easily spotted if you look carefully. What are the symptoms and signs of spiritual famine in the culture? Evil is celebrated, morality is subjective, truth is relative. We know this to be true. These are signs of spiritual biblical famine. Ultimately, the cultural famine that we see around the world and around our own country are symptoms 
of a spiritual famine in the churches. Some signs and symptoms of spiritual famine in the churches. Now, not this church, because we teach the Bible from cover to cover here at Cornerstone Chapel. But around the churches here and even our own backyard, signs and symptoms of spiritual famine in the church, the full counsel of the Bible is not taught, plays and productions are the focus, sin and repentance are not discussed, social reform is the focus, the pulpit is silent on issues of morality, life, gender, sexuality, and the Bible itself is being altered to fit the world's agenda. You see this, you know this. The Bible itself is now being altered to fit the world's agenda. How do we know this? Look at the news. Here are some headlines I tracked down for us so that we can just clearly see there is biblical famine going on around the world. Here was an article I read just two months ago. AI chatbot preaches at church in Germany. Look how packed this church is. It's a Lutheran church in Germany. Hadn't experienced this many people in its building for years. Suddenly we put an AI avatar on the screen and people are interested in church. This is unbelievable. Here's what the article goes on to say. A unique sermon was delivered via artificial intelligence Friday in a Lutheran church in Germany. The 40 minute service was created by Chat GPT and Jonas Simmerlein, a theologian and philosopher from the University of Vienna who said that 98% of it came from the machine. The entire service was led by four different avatars on the screen. And then afterwards, after the service, they took a poll around the sanctuary and this article documented some of the responses. Some of the audience members said there was no heart and no soul. Like they were confused. There was no heart, no soul behind this. But others thought it worked well. Quote, I had actually imagined it to be worse, but I was positively surprised how well it worked. Also, the language of the AI worked well, even though it was still a bit bumpy at times, says Mark Jansen, a Lutheran pastor. What the pastor missed, however, was any kind of emotion or spirituality, which he says is essential when he writes his sermons. Yeah, no duh. Okay, there's no emotionality behind this. Now, it's unbelievable. It's very interesting what's going on with the advancement of technology. There's like a love and hate relationship with it. But we should be, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by this. The book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13, the Bible actually says that in the last days, the Antichrist will erect an image. In the Greek, it's icon, E-I-K-O-N. The Antichrist will erect an icon, it's where we get our English word icon, I-C-O-N. And he will erect an image and the Bible says that the Antichrist will actually breathe life into this image. It's a Greek word, pneuma, and it means power. The Antichrist will breathe life or power into this image and demand that everyone bow down and worship it. This is a precursor to what we will see in the end times. We shouldn't be surprised. Article number two, World Economic Forum contributor says that AI could rewrite the Bible and create correct religions. Now, Yuval Noah Harari, he, uh, he's a professor at a Hebrew university in Jerusalem, not a believer, um, an atheist, and he's known for being a contributor and speaker at the World Economic Forum. If you don't know anything about the World Economic Forum, you need to do your research. And he is promoting the idea that AI will be able to generate a new globally accepted religious book. Quote, it's the first technology ever that can create new ideas. You know, the printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. But Harari says that AI will soon be able to invent new concepts and beliefs that are more socially acceptable than the Bible. Quote, AI can create new ideas. It can even write a new Bible in order to establish a more unified, correct religion. Quote, throughout history, religions have dreamed about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. That's already happened. God is spirit, he is not human. 
Harari explains, now he believes AI will become a new type of God. In a few years, quote, there might be religions that are actually correct. Just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI, Harari said. That could be a reality in a few years. Next article, PETA. Now, this is probably my favorite. PETA uses AI to rewrite the book of Genesis, create own version of creation story. As my dad calls PETA, people eating tasty animals. The organization released a May 3rd statement claiming it's going biblical. Now, isn't this interesting? PETA is claiming they're going biblical by completely twisting and perverting what the Bible actually says in the creation narrative. But they claim they're going biblical. PETA apparently, according to this article, they're they're giving the Old Testament text a modern makeover to send a can't-be-missed animal rights message filled with vegan teachings. What does this exactly mean? Well, according to Peter, it's an effort to present a cruelty-free story of creation and in the process appeal to Gen Z. Peter has amended specific names and titles given to God uh, in, given to God's creation in the text. Quote, in the book, Peter's version of the creation story, animals are referred to as beings rather than beasts or creatures. And part of Abraham's story in Genesis chapter 22 says that Abraham the patriarch, rather than sacrificing a ram, he befriends a lamb. I don't know why I just spoke in a British accent there, but um, just the Holy Spirit just told me to for fun. Um, This is unbelievable. This is twisting and perverting the scriptures, changing the creation story, the creation account, and changing the story of where Abraham Before sacrificing his son Isaac, God provides a ram that he sacrifices, but no, they're now perverting the scriptures so that he doesn't sacrifice an animal, but he rather befriends a lamb. Listen, all of this in the Old Testament was foreshadowing the greater sacrifice of Jesus. You need to understand the full narrative of the scriptures. But we shouldn't be surprised, Romans 125 says that In latter times, we will replace the truth of God with a lie, and we will worship the creation rather than the creator. Last article, this should be no surprise to us. Worshiping government as God, China tries to rewrite the Bible, brainwash children. The Chinese Communist Party is rewriting the Bible with with revisions that attempt to portray Jesus in a different light. The article says it's part of a 10-year plan to force Chinese citizens to have faith in the Chinese Communist Party rather than a religion. You see, the Chinese Communist Party know that they can't overcome or remove the underground church or the Bible altogether, so what we'll do is we'll just twist and pervert it. And in a revision of the Bible, what the Chinese Communist Party has done is they have, amongst many other passages, just one for example, they have changed John chapter 8. You know what happens in John chapter 8? Jesus, he's met with a woman caught in adultery. And in the true account of the scriptures, the Bible says that the woman is brought before Jesus and the elders, and they say this woman was caught in adultery. Jesus says, he who is without the first stone, or he who is without sin, cast the first stone. All of her accusers leave. Jesus looks at the woman, he says, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and leave your life of sin. In the, communist, uh, in the Chinese Communist Party revision of this passage, Jesus actually stones the woman himself and says, I too am a sinner. Okay, this, these are all spiritual signs of biblical famine going, around, going on around the world. And altering the scriptures is a sign that there is unbelievable famine of hearing the word of the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 4 says that the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, people will abandon the faith and incline their ear to hear the doctrine of demons. And then Paul again would say to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that people would no longer in the latter days endure sound doctrine but they would heap up for themselves teachers who would tell them what they'd want to hear. This is happening in our day and age. Do you see this? Everybody with me? Everybody with me? These are all signs of spiritual famine. Now, we could spend the last few minutes 
complaining about the wayward church, rebuking the chaotic culture, but ultimately the chaotic culture and the wayward church, they are symptoms of the apathetic, rebellious individual heart. And we could continue, and there is a time and a place to rebuke the wayward church and scream and be angry at a chaotic culture, but rather than do that, what we need to do is we need to humbly, individually come before the Lord and say, Lord, examine my heart. Test me, know me. Lord, I am open, completely bare before you, and I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would go to work in my own life, that you would weed out the things that dishonor and displease you, that you would affirm and confirm the ways I am living in righteousness so that I can please you and live for you. But before we point the finger at the rest of the world who is strayed from God, we shouldn't be surprised. There's nothing personal. There are spiritual forces behind the scenes at work. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but our wrestle, our war is against principalities of the dark world. Satan and his demons are behind the scenes. And we can continue to complain about what Satan is doing, but first, before we do that, let's examine our own lives before the Lord and humbly come before him broken about our own sin. Say, Lord, if I personally am straying from your word, indulging in sin, sometimes ignorantly, Lord, reveal that to me by your Holy Spirit so I can turn back to you and repent. So in our remaining time, as we just sit before the Lord, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a personal examination. We're gonna take a personal examination, take personal inventory of our own lives, And what we're going to do is we're going to have seven signs of spiritual famine in your own life. I'm going to go through seven signs that you might currently be in a spiritual famine. The very first point is you can't detect the voice of the Holy Spirit. If you struggle to discern and detect the voice of the Holy Spirit, it may be a sign that you are in a biblical or spiritual famine. Now, what do I mean by this? Sometimes we think that in order to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, the heavens will part, angels will be singing, they'll be sounding their trumpets, the Lord will give us dreams and visions. Oh Lord, this is your Holy Spirit. Again, I don't know why I keep going into the King James British mode there. But this is sometimes what we think. We think that we approach God using this King James verbiage and that the Lord will hear our prayers because we spit out these and thou's. Oh, Lord, split the heavens. May I hear from your Holy Spirit. And when we don't hear in that way through dreams and visions, we feel discouraged. Oh, I'm not detecting the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, yes, absolutely the voice of God can appear to us in dreams and visions. Absolutely. God can communicate through those means and measures. But more often than not, The voice of the Holy Spirit is this calm whisper upon your heart, pointing back to the words of Jesus in your Bibles. This is what Jesus would say in John chapter 14, verse 26. Before he was crucified to a cross, he was with his disciples in the upper room. And he said, listen, I'm gonna go away. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Have you ever been in conversations with people? You're talking about faith, you're talking about spiritual matters, you're talking about the Bible, and the Holy Spirit will just start to bring Bible verses to your mind and memory. That's detecting the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because the primary role of the Holy Spirit is to point back to the scriptures, to point back to Jesus, to point back to his words. And so when you're having conversations with people, the Holy Spirit will whisper Bible verses to your heart. He'll impress things upon your mind. And you're like, I don't even know where that came from. I I haven't read that verse in years, but the Holy Spirit points back to the scriptures, brings to your remembrance all things that Jesus taught us in the scriptures. And if you struggle to hear from the Holy Spirit, this could be a sign you're in the midst of spiritual famine. Number two, You may be in a spiritual drought if you struggle to discern right versus wrong, good versus evil, truth versus lie. It was, I believe, Charles Spurgeon who said that discernment is not knowing the difference between right versus wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. You see, there are a lot of voices and opinions out in the world about who Jesus is, about the Bible. I just threw up four wacko articles 
A lot of voices and opinions you see scrolling through social media about the Bible, about who God is. And what Satan does is he takes truth and he laces it with lies. So there's a lot of things that sound almost right. But your discernment by the Holy Spirit kicks in because you've been in the Word of God. And you're able to cut through that. You can discern right versus wrong, good versus evil, truth versus lie. Why? Because you're in the Word of God. Psalm 119 verse 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. You need discernment. You need understanding about how to respond to the different cultural stuff going on. You got to get in the Word of God. And if you struggle to do that, you struggle to use discernment, it may be a sign of spiritual famine. Number three, you're blind to sin in your own life. And when you're confronted about your sin, you don't think it's a big deal. This is a big sign of spiritual famine. Psalm 119 Verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, when we, when we get in God's word, we memorize scripture, we hide it in our heart. When our conscience is bothered, Bible verses come to our mind, helping us resist the appetite of the flesh. Paul would then say in Romans 7, 7, he says, I wouldn't even have known what sin was unless it was for the word of God. More specifically, he says, I wouldn't have known what coveting was unless the Bible says don't covet. You see this, God's word is like a mirror. And when you're constantly in the word of God and you're reading God's word, it's like a mirror. It reflects back on you all the dirt and sin of my life. It's like a spotlight that shines brightly on all the blemishes and sin of my life. But that doesn't happen if you're not in the word of God. And so if you, when confronted about sin, you don't think it's a big deal, you're blind to sin in your own life, it's a sign of spiritual famine. It means you're not in the Bible. My goodness, I can't help but read the Bible and then by the Holy Spirit just feel strong conviction about the ways my life isn't lining up to the moral standard of God's word. But that's the effect of God's word, but it's a good thing because the Bible does two things. It explains what sin is, but then it exposes sin in us. So we come to the mirror of God's word to see all the filth and sin, but then Ephesians chapter five says, but you come to the word and the word washes you as well. It's a twofold effect. It points out all the sin in my life. But then by the Holy Spirit, through the word, it washes you. And God doesn't want you to justify sin anymore or coddle your sin because that's the nature of our humanness. We justify sin, we coddle sin, but God says, I want you to come to me broken, confessing your sin, and the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your sin from us. But that happens when we confess from our sin and repent of it. And when you go to the mirror of God's word, it exposes sin, but it washes you over by the Holy Spirit. And when you're confronted about sin, if you don't think it's a big deal, it's a sign of spiritual famine. Number four, I'll race through these next three points. Number four, you easily give in to the appetite of the flesh. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have two different appetites now because the Bible says you come into faith in relationship with Jesus Christ, you're now filled with the Holy Spirit. So you now have the appetite of the Holy Spirit and the appetite of the flesh. Now this is very encouraging. I, I talk to young adults all the time who say, listen, Pastor Austin, I, um, I've really, my conscience has been bothered. I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit because I've been indulging in sin and now I'm starting to doubt my salvation. I say, oh, that's awesome. Not the doubting your salvation part, but the fact that you're convicted and bothered by your sin tells me you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Go in peace. This is awesome. Now leave your life of sin and now be convicted by the Holy Spirit and repent of your sin. But that's an awesome thing to feel that war within you because this is what Galatians 5 says. Paul says, so I say to you, walk in the Spirit so you don't gratify the desires of your flesh. For the flesh wants what's contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit wants what's contrary to their flesh and they are at war with one another. So then he goes on to say in Galatians chapter six, verse eight, he says, so I say to you, sow to the spirit and reap everlasting life. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap everlasting destruction. And so if you have the tendency to easily give in to the appetite of the flesh, it may mean you're in spiritual famine because when you're in the word of God by his Holy Spirit, you are feeding the appetite of the spirit and the appetite you feed the most will be the appetite to consume the other. 
But it's not until you're feeding the appetite of the Spirit, getting in God's Word, praying, surrounding yourself with other believers, turning on Bible teachings and podcasts, listening to worship music in your car on the way home. These are all ways we feed the appetite of the Spirit and we starve the appetite of the flesh. Point number five, your faith is on low. You hear today and your faith is extremely on low. Well, get in the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want your faith to mature? You want your faith to grow? You want God to stretch your faith, mature you, conform you more into His image and strengthen your faith? Get in God's Word. Number six, you lack joy and hope. You hear today and you feel joyless. You don't feel much hope in life. Get in God's word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. And Paul would say in Romans 15, 4, for everything that was written in the past, everything that was written, was written to teach us so that the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might now have hope. You want joy and hope in life, get in the scriptures. Finally, last point, number seven. Do you lack direction in life? This might be a sign of spiritual famine because Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You have questions about your future. Now you might not necessarily be able to point to chapter and verse to tell you, should I move there? Should I go there? Should I marry this person? Should I take that promotion? But when you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. That's what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. When you fix your eyes on the Lord, and the way you fix your eyes on the Lord is you get in his word, the Lord will speak to you. He will calmly guide and direct your steps, and there's nothing to worry or fear when you're in the word of God, because he will speak to you. Now, these might be signs that you're in the midst of spiritual famine, if you can relate to any of these points. Austin, how did you come up with these points? Did you Google these points? Where did you get these things from? These seven points were the quickest part of my prep. Why? Because lest you think I came here to beat up on a spiritually dry church or people in the midst of spiritual famine, all of these things I've experienced in my own life. The Holy Spirit gave me these seven things so quickly. Why? Because I've experienced all of these things. Be encouraged today. For those of you who are believers who feel like you are in the midst of spiritual famine, the exhortation to you today and the call to you today is come home Christian. Return to the Lord. Repent of sin. Get in the Word of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're here and you're not a believer today, these might be signs or symptoms of an unbelieving person as well, obviously, because you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't have ultimate hope. You, You lack direction in life. You don't know what your purpose is. But when you come into faith with Jesus Christ, he fills you with his Holy Spirit and he gives you newfound direction and purpose, joy, peace, hope, and love, and all the fruit of the Spirit. So my call to you, for those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, listen. God loves you, and he died on the cross for your sin. And God's wrath was placed on his son, Jesus Christ, at the cross. So that for those of you who come into relationship with Jesus, you trust in Jesus' death for you on the cross, you believe he rose from the dead, God's wrath will pass over you, and you are a new creature in Christ, and welcome to the family of God. But it starts with believing and repenting. You repent of sin, say, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I've done that. I've tried that. It doesn't lead to peace and satisfaction, though, yes, sin is fun for a season, the Bible says. It ultimately leads to my own lack of satisfaction. And I don't want to live for myself or my sin any longer. I want the Lord. That's what repentance is. You turn from that sin and you trust in the cross. Guess what? You can't do anything good enough to get to Jesus. You can't perform for Jesus. The Bible says our sins are like filthy rags compared to a holy God. You can't perform. The good news is Jesus performed for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. And by Jesus' performance on the cross, you can be made right with God. But you turn from sin and you trust in God's sacrifice for you on the cross and his son, Jesus. Do you know him today? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. No longer be in spiritual drought any longer when you come into relationship with Jesus. But the call to the believer as well remains true. Come home today. Turn from sin and know the Lord. And he will wash you. And he will fill you with streams of living water. One of my favorite verses in Acts 3.19. 
It says, turn from your sin. Repent, therefore, and God will, turn, will, will, will wipe out your sin, and you will experience rivers of living water. I'll close with a verse from Isaiah 55. I was reading it this morning, and it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, for the Lord will have mercy on him, and he will abundantly pardon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would just lavish your love upon us. For the unbelievers in this room today, would you give them a godly sorrow over sin? And would you bring them into right relationship with you through your son? For those who are believers experiencing spiritual drought or spiritual famine, would you be as bold just with eyes closed and heads bowed, would you just raise your hand and you say, Austin, that's me. I've just been in a spiritual drought. I just need a refreshing fill of the Holy Spirit. Father, you know the hands and the hearts that are raised, and would you now baptize them and fill them full with your Holy Spirit? Would you quicken their hearts to sin? Would there be confession and repentance of sin, Lord? And would they find renewed strength in you by your Holy Spirit, Lord? Do a new work in their hearts today and fill them afresh with your Spirit and the living Word of God. Do that work in our hearts today, Lord. Refresh our hearts and minds. May we turn to you and fall more in love with you, Lord. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name and all God's people together said, amen. <laughs>